Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everybody. At the beginning of our program, as always, the doc becomes a beef box, and people with gripes are asked to come up, state their names, and state their gripes. State your name, please. Mrs. Martha Elliott. Your gripe? There is a television commercial that's out at this time that I find personally offensive, and I'd like to register a big, strong gripe about it. There is a ladies, a well-known ladies hair coloring has came out with a men's hair coloring, and perhaps you've seen the commercial. It shows a man with one half of his face mask, and it shows him all gray, and then it shows him the other side of his face, and it's mass, of, and he's dyed, and then at the very end of the commercial, he comes off, and he takes the mask away. One side is white, one side is dyed, and he says, don't be silly like me, dye all of your hair. I find that personally offensive because I happen to have a natural white streak in my hair. My father had it, my grandfather had it, and I have sons that have it. Now, I don't think that's very nice of them to get out there and talk about my hair like that. <laughs> you know, I wish, I wish to heaven I had these kinds of problems. Is, th is that really a, a, a gripe? Is that the thing that really, really bothers I find you the it, most? I find it offensive, You mean yes. the people no, saying, I'm does she or doesn't she? Is that what bothers you? No, uh, I have learned you? to live with that. What's that? I have learned to live with that. Uh -huh. As a child, I grew up, and I had all that to contend with. You mean that's natural, different. just the way it came it out? It is please. natural. I have children that have it. I have a son in the audience who Turn has it. Turn around. Let's see the, the back part of it. Oh, it's gray. It is just the one side, isn't it? Yes, it goes in my eyebrows. In fact, I've been examined to see if it goes clear. Actually, the medical term I'm a... <laughs> I don't, think, uh, I don't think we have to pursue the medical aspects of this. I, I think we can talk about your hair without being anatomical, don't you? Well, actually, I'm a partial albino, Mr. Pine. I see. I a think partial, that's better than being all the way. A partial albino. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, aren't your eyes supposed to be a certain color? No, my eyes are, well, my eyes are green, if that has anything to do with it. Uh -huh. But the pigmentation does not extend down on the eyes. I do have a skin problem with it. In other when, words, you are one of these rare people, if you were a full albino... You I wouldn't be, have any color. You could be one, one of the few white people in America. Yes. Right? Really? Yes. Because you would lack pigmentation beneath the skin totally. Yes. Then you couldn't go out in the sun or without I, protection. Uh, I'm very susceptible to the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, your hair looks very nice. I don't well, know what you're I just, bugged about. I, well, this darn commercial, the guy says it looks silly. I had a man come up to me once in the store. Well, wait a minute. You said it was a, a commercial about a man. It's, I guess he did look silly with this side one thing and this side something well, else. But a woman. it looks just like I look when I look in the mirror. But women go and pay to have well, done I what you... Well, I don't. Uh, no, but I say they do. Well, if they can afford it, fine. But I don't do anything <laughs> like that. Well, what do you think we ought to do about it? I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. will not. Dye your I hair, they said. To. I will not. Don't start picking on my audience. <laughs> well, make them shut up. I'm Why not going to dye my hair. I don't tell them to dye their hair. Why don't you? I don't tell them to wear green s pajamas or anything. Why don't you... Uh, well, then, would you like to get up here? <laughs> You better keep in mind this is not an audience, this is a jury. Well, <laughs> well if you don't like the diet, would you consider cutting off the part that offends you? Why? It doesn't offend me. Huh? The commercial offends me. I'd like for them to cut the commercial off. Well, have you tried turning that little knob on your set? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. But that doesn't stop it from going all over the country. Well, I really don't think that you look bad at all, and I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. I really wouldn't. Thank you. Right. Happy days. Man, I wish I had... I wish that was a problem. I wish that was the only problem in the world. Don't you, huh? All the things that are going on. I'd like you to meet our first guest of the evening, who won't be a stranger to you. Seated here with me now is one of the most controversial figures in America, James Meredith has probably created as much stir in the civil rights movement as anyone in the country. As you know, he's been shot, applauded, criticized, and accused of being a loner in a movement made up of organized groups. One thing is sure, Jim Meredith does exactly what Meredith wants to do about anything and about everything, apparently. Is that about the size of it? Well, I don't know. I don't think I do what I want to do about anything. Uh, when you... We're in the middle of that march, and you got hurt, and you went away for a while, and you came back. I was uh, amazed to see that you had had a falling out, at least temporarily, with uh, your leader, uh, Martin Luther King, at least to the point where, according to the paper, they were quoting you right, they, you shoved some Martin Luther King lieutenants. True or false? Well, I, uh, 
You uh, shove them away from you as they walk, try to walk alongside you? <laughs> Physically? Uh, no, I don't know. Um, uh, if they were his lieutenants or not. Well, these were representatives, shall we say, of King. Did you, did you, they identify you, uh, to, did they identify themselves to you as lieutenants of King or as representatives of King who wanted to talk with you and walk along with you, and did you push them out of the way at that time? I mean, w was the paper uh, writing it correctly or not? That's what I'm trying to find out. Yes, that did occur. That happened. Mm -hmm. Well, were you just bugged with the heat, or were you bugged with King's <laughs> tactics, or these people in particular, or what was the cause uh, of that? Because well, it was... Well, these people in particular... Without regard to Martin Luther King, because later you did meet with him. Oh, yes. And you apparently had a satisfactory, uh, oh, friendly yes. meeting. Yes, quite satisfactory, I think. Roy Wilkins says of you, quote, James Meredith is a proud man who has supreme confidence in James Meredith. Is that his polite way of calling you a, an egotist? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if he has to be polite. He's not always polite. Uh, imagine if he wanted to say something, he would. Well, I think he's considered to be the, uh, the diplomat in the Negro movement, uh, sometimes to his detriment because some of the young Turks call him an Uncle Tom. Where do you put Roy Wilkins, uh, Wilkins in the spectrum of uh, the Negro movement? Well, um, Roy Wilkins is a Negro. He's uh, an older man. He must be at least 60. Um, what does that mean? He's over the hill? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know uh, how I would categorize him or his position. Uh, he's with the NAACP. Um, I'm not quite sure what his authoritative position is with the NAACP. Uh, You're so, not? Uh, no, I'm not. You mean what the people think it is or what his title is or what? Oh, I know what his title is, executive director. You think it might be a front? Well, um, it's certainly a misnomer. Uh, I often see him listed as the head of the NAACP. Of course, the head is Kivy Kaplan, a good mm -hmm. friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the, uh, the shooting. I guess you've talked about it enough, but uh, I'd uh, like to hear about it again. Uh, can you show me where on your head you received some pellets? Well, the hair's grown back now. In the back uh, of your head? Uh, yes, yeah, all over the back of my head. Uh, did you go right out, or did you stay conscious at the time? Well, I, I think I remained conscious the whole time. George S. Schuyler. Recognize the name? Schuyler. Schuyler, editor and reporter for Negro newspapers for over 40 years. I want to quote what he says and have you comment on it. He says, quote, allegedly the purpose of the march, meaning your march, was to stimulate Negro voter registration by demonstrating that there was nothing to fear. Correct so far? Yes, go ahead. All right. He goes on. Thousands of colored and white Mississippians walk or ride along the public roads daily without fear of anything except being run over. But Meredith's journey was no innocent, quixotic trek. It was calculated, planned, and doubtless financed by the same agitational elements that organized, trained, and commanded the operatives of the Conference of Federated Organizations, known as COFO, who invaded Mississippi for the long, hot summer of 1964. That's in his syndicated column, The Register of uh, 6 Your Well, comment. if I recognize that name, this is the same fellow that speak for the John Burke Society and other right-wing groups. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the same name. Well, uh, assuming that he is, or assuming that he isn't for the moment, what about the statement here? Is any part of it true beyond the business of you're trying to get people not to, uh, to fear anything? That, is it true, for example, that uh, Negroes and whites uh, go along those roads without fear of anything except getting run over? Um, I, uh, I don't think that, uh, uh, that we have to, uh, there certainly was something that this country was interested in along those roads. It was something that the people in Mississippi was interested in. And, uh, I don't believe that you can uh, fool anybody or anything long. Anywhere you find an interest in, 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 uh, in if, if it's fear, uh, then it it's, it's must be basic. It has to be something to cause the interest. We'll be back with James Meredith after these words from the sponsor. Stand by.
Mr. Meredith, are you a revolutionary? Well, I don't know. It's the first time I heard that word. Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. Are you uh, dedicated to the violent overthrow of this government? Oh, that's what you mean. Well... That's one of the meanings of a revolutionary. There are many. <laughs> I want to know about that one. Well, I, uh, uh, I don't see why there'd be anything to gain by that. You don't? Then why did you say, sir, and these are your words, American Negroes have no choice but to seek the overthrow of the U.S. government if they cannot win equality under it? I uh, never made any such statement sir. as that. You made that statement in Khartoum, the Sudan. No, I, I didn't make that statement. Some uh, writer from the Los Angeles Times uh, uh, made that statement. The Los Angeles and, Times uh, misquoted you. Uh, no, they lied. They and, lied. Uh, uh, I made exactly the same speech at Indiana University, word for word. And uh, uh, no one even commented on it. Well, now... How could that be a Los Angeles Times uh, lie when it would have to have been a wire story? Well, One I mean, of the press services would have... I saw it, it read... Did the LA Times have anybody with you in the Sudan? Uh, apparently they did, because it was a Los Angeles uh, correspondent special or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I have uh, some of the Times articles here. I don't know offhand uh, which one it is, but... Uh, We'll look around for it as we go along, and maybe I can find it during one of the breaks. Have you called for removal of the jury trial requirement from the Bill of Rights, at least for Negroes, as a basic step toward equality? Um, as long as we have the jury system in this country, uh, there can be no justice, no equal justice before the law. What would you replace the jury system with? Um, well... What do you have in mind? Judges. Judges. Judges that are... Any particular color judges? Well, I think they should be uh, qualified. I think they should be picked on a basis other than uh, uh, political. Uh, and... Um, you don't think then that a man should be tried before a jury of his peers? Well, if this were the case, but a man is not tried before his peers. Well, and supposing then... then Supposing, then, that where a Negro was involved, they changed the law to state that uh, one half of the jury must be Negro. Would you then be in favor of retaining oh, the Negro? I'm not interested the, in... The jury? Uh, a Negro jury is just as bigoty and capable of being as white. Uh, you mean that, that when a man gets on a jury, something happens to his personality, and even if he's a liberal, he becomes a bigot? Well, I know this. I know that in the history of the South, in the history of Mississippi, there's never been a case where a Negro has been accused of a crime against a white uh, where he received uh, fair treatment. There's never been a case of a white man being given justice, uh, a just punishment for a crime against a Negro. Now, I know that, and I, I See, know that's in that, the South. Uh, well, that's not true all over the country, uh, though, is it? It's not uh, restricted to the South. But it's not, you couldn't make the same statement about the country, could you? Uh, you could, by and large. You could make it about Los Angeles. Uh, this is, you could make it about any city. About any city in the United States? Just that no, no white man has ever been executed for the murder of a no, Negro? No, I didn't say that. What are you saying? I said, just, just punishment. And this is the thing that, uh, that we have to be concerned about. Well, what do you mean by just punishment? Wouldn't that be uh, whatever the jury decides? Just punishment is, uh, we say in Mississippi, if uh, a Negro kills a white, uh, if, the, uh, if it was second-degree murder, it's a uh, 15 or 20-year sentence. That's what he should get. If a white kills a Negro in first degree, that's a death penalty. That's what he should get. That's what I mean by just, just punishment. All right. Have you said this, and here's another quote, on the other side of the sword, just as the law always works against the Negro, it always works in favor of the white man. Uh, that is absolutely the case. Okay, that's true. Now, don't you think that uh, you're being a little bit ungrateful when you consider what this country did and what we all went through to send you into college? <laughs> I think that went over? I mean, I remember the troops down there. I remember hearing what, what it was costing for one man to go to college. I mean, you could have gone to uh, 
probably any college in the North and been accepted, uh, assuming that uh, you were up to par on their standards of uh, scholarship. But you wanted to go there, and you had the right to go there. And this uh, white man, supreme type uh, government that we have saw to it that you went there. And incidentally, after you finally got in there and things settled down, you quit. No, I think you got the wrong man. I have the wrong man. I'm pretty sure you got the wrong Did man. Did you quit? Well, I don't know what you call quit. Did you leave school? Well, I left after I got my degree. I don't know... Uh, At that school? I don't know how long you wanted me to go. Did you I, get your degree from that school? From the University of Mississippi, yes. At Oxford? At, at, at Oxford. How long did you spend there? One year. How could you get a degree in one year? I guess I'm smart. What, were you a chiropractor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, uh, how could you get a degree in one year? Uh, well... Think that one over? <laughs> I don't know, maybe they wanted to get me out of there. No, seriously, I'm asking, don't you think, if, if it's true that, uh, as you say, uh, justice in this country always works in favor of the white man, that uh, white justice bent over backwards to see to it that you got into a school that didn't want you? Well, I don't want white, white justice bent anyway. I want justice, equal justice. No, but this is, I'm just uh, using that phrase because you've used it. In other words, you say on the other side of the sword, but here was a case where uh, 180 million Americans, as opposed to 20 million Negroes, decided that uh, whatever amount of white people down there didn't want you in that school, they should not prevail against the United States' uh, guarantee of your safety and civil rights. Well, when you make a statement like that, you're leaving me out, and I can't ever be left out. How am I you, leaving you out? Well, you're saying that, uh, that you have the decision uh, over my life, and no one has that. I mean... Uh, you I, made the decision. Well, James uh, Meredith, you decided well, to I'm go to that school. I'm glad you're recognizing that fact. Well, you, no, but you decided yeah. to go to that school. But you couldn't have done anything about it if the law hadn't seen well, to it that you did I get in there. I don't feel quite as helpless as you seem to think I do. Well, now, I what mean, would you uh, have done? Would you have walked up there and knocked down four or five people and sat down at your desk, or how would you have accomplished it? Well, I always think there's a way, and I, I keep trying. I think there's a way that we're going to uh, rid this whole country of white supremacy and it's... There's a uh, way that you're trying to weasel out of my question and I'm aware of the way and I want to bring you back to that way. Now, isn't it true that an awful lot of white people worked awfully hard to get you into college? Is that true or isn't it? A lot more than worked against you. Well, you, uh, you, you're asking a, a question now that... Um, Were your civil rights protected by the federal government? You, um... <laughs> that's right. That's exactly how I feel about it. How do you feel about it? Well, if, you, if they weren't telling me, and then tell me, please, why we paid all those salaries of all those troops that were down there all that time. Do you remember the figures? They were published. You must have uh, kind of well, memorized them. Yeah, but I remember other figures. I remember 400 years of Negroes being denied. I remember... Uh, <laughs> Well, James Meredith, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to dispute that, and, uh, and if you want to, I'll give you a thousand years of denial by your own tribes throughout Africa, if you want that. You know, I mean, we, we don't want to get Well, I tell you what, if you think that. I'm going to pat you on your back, you and all the rest of them, I'm not going to do it. Not me, or not fair. all the rest of them, but I'm uh, saying, where uh, is your pride in a government that uh, spent more to keep you in that They could have built uh, a college and put you in there alone for the money they spent. Uh, that's, uh, Isn't that true? What if did it, it cost? Do you recall what it cost? If it is, you say it. I'm not going to say right. it. Yeah, all right. What did it cost? I don't know and don't really care. I know, uh, I know what it you cost. You must have read what it look, cost. You look, must have yeah. had some idea what look, it cost. Look, you know how many Negroes die every year in Mississippi because they don't get proper health uh, uh, and care of their health and proper food, probably proper shelter? Quite, probably quite a few. Uh, that's right, quite right. a few. You know how many white people die because of the same thing? Uh, I don't know. Probably quite a few. All right, now well, quite a few. Well, now my interest. <laughs> so my what did we just what did we just prove by that? And what has that got to do with the fact that Uncle Sam backed you up, a lone man, my one interest, individual? My interest is in no one dying because they don't get proper health. Fine, and, and that'd food. be good. That'd be good. See? And uh, look. Um, I know out in California they got a lot of people who think like uh, the questions you asked me. 
Now, um, <clears throat> this country in California is a good example. It's based on the doctrine of white supremacy. Now, if you continue to live by that system, I believe that we all may someday be playing second fiddle to uh, maybe Red China. Now, if you choose that way, it's all right. I think the best thing for this country to do is to really put into practice its uh, if they didn't put it into its, practice its policies of uh, uh, claim policies of equal uh, equality of uh, uh, equal justice before the law, and uh, I think that uh, we may find ourselves all wishing we had taken a different position in the years are you, to come. Are you making a threat? Uh, a threat to who? To the country? Any same threat I make to you, I'm making to myself. To the country? Are you, so uh, you, are you threatening the country? That's right, if you want to take it as that. Yeah. If this country does not implement the ideals that we claim to live by, of equality, of justice before the law, I think we all might be playing second fiddle to somebody else. Well, I think we got a hell of a start when we sent you to college. I'm just sorry you didn't stay in. We'll be back to you, James Meredith, after these words. Stand by. I think uh, we'll go no farther until we show that uh, James Meredith has written a book called Three Years in Mississippi. He said to me, how come you didn't show the book yet? So there it is. Get a good look at it. Three Years in Mississippi. Although it uh, perhaps covers a lifetime in one way or another. Well, Medgar, Ever Medgar Evers' brother seems to think that you're some kind of a publicity hound. Charles Evers? Yes. I've never known him to say any such thing as that. Well, let me tell you what he said, and I watched him on TV, so this won't be the L.A. Times saying bad things about you. <laughs> this is going to be what he said. He said, when all these marchers have marched through and they're gone and the, all the television cameras have left and everything else, he said, the Negro will still be struggling for his right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. He said, we don't need people to run marches and things like that and to pose in front of the camera and that kind of thing. He said, what we need for people to come down here and go back in the woods and register people. He said, when all said and done, nothing's being done for the poor Negro in my neighborhood. Well, uh, first place, he doesn't live in a poor neighborhood. But um, Charles Evers is uh, a very good friend of mine, not as good a friend as his brother was. But, uh, uh, and he came to see me in the hospital. He assured me that uh, these rumors that I'd hear about what things he said, that it was not true. Well, you are uh, looking at someone right now who saw him say that on television. Yeah, I know, I but guarantee then you. I talked to him just uh, about three days ago, and he assured me that uh, uh, he uh, would cooperate in Mississippi with any further program wholeheartedly, and I, uh, I believe him. Now, a lot of people don't understand Charles Evers. Charles Evers is the brother of Mega Evers, who was killed. And um, he, uh, he's a man that uh, he speaks out. And uh, he, um, uh, uh, is, um, uh, he says a lot of things. And if you don't know him well, you can misunderstand him very much. Oh, you think that was my trouble, <coughs> not knowing him well? Uh, well, I think so. Because uh, if uh, Charles just says a lot of things. But and, you know uh, what he said to me made a lot of sense? Yeah. Well, what was that? About the television cameras and the publicity. Made a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you talk about white supremacy and everything. Look at you. We flew you out here, put you up at the plush Knickerbocker. You're going to Disneyland tomorrow. <laughs> That's a far cry from slavery, isn't it? But now you've got to tell the whole rest of the story. You've uh -huh. got to tell him how hard you had to work to get me to uh, agree to this. Did I ever talk to you? Uh, well, but your folks did. And, uh, I don't have any relatives. I don't have any relatives working on this show. Now, um, no, that's not that's not the point. The point is that uh, uh, this can't be too much of a white supremacy deal. I, I recall only oh, two that other thing occasions. Oh, you're talking about. Oh. Two other two other occasions when people have been flown out here for the show. Madeline Murray was one. Look. And the other was um, uh, look, Mrs. Oswald. I think you misunderstand me on the point of white supremacy. Now. Um, Tell me about it. You probably saw in Canton, Mississippi, I uh, heard, where I went in and talked to the sheriff, and the sheriff came out and for the first time in history gave, offered full protection to the Negro unconditionally. 
Now, I'm not going to say too much about what we talked about in there. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we talked about was the problem and the cause. And I said to this sheriff that I know that you have no more to do with the position that you hold in this struggle than I do. You are on one side because you were born white. I'm on the other side because I'm born Negro. You have no more responsibility for the condition as it exists. Now, we both have responsibility to correct. Now, uh, I'm not saying that um, uh, every white in this country uh, is now himself an active white supremacist. I'm saying that the base upon which we are built is that. And uh, I know that a lot of people don't like the system. But the thing is, we have it. And uh, We're not the only ones who have it, are we? No, no. The British have it. Right. The whole Western civilization has it. And uh, uh, maybe at some point in the history it might have been good. I don't know. Africa has it. Oh, definitely Africa has it. Africa is a part of Western civilization. man told me, uh, not long, no, a lady, as a matter of fact, a, a documentary uh, film person, uh, Jerry Tully, who goes over there and makes African uh, films and so forth, uh, as a completely uh, neutral person, told me that in order to get people to work in the mines, various tribes have to be brought in with time spaces in between, otherwise they'd attack each other. I know that, uh, uh, well, white supremacy is, is definitely the rule in Africa. You're doing pretty good for a man with one year of college. Just got <laughs> back from Africa, wrote a book, going to Disneyland tomorrow. Well, uh, and I've been to Disneyland before, too. So how and come you're going back? Well, I haven't gonna march I'm on taking him? my boy. You going to march on him? I'm taking my boy and uh, my wife. There's a man out here who's coming on later as a guest who claims that you were a communist trained in Ghana. Yeah, well, this gentleman asked me a few minutes ago, and I wondered why he did it, how long I'd stayed in Ghana, and he looked surprised when I told him I hadn't. I hadn't spent any time in Ghana. We so, asked him uh, to come up because he... Uh, that, that must sort of foul up his program. Well, uh, uh, I don't think his program is based on you, but he does uh, have certain positions that are uh, opposite to you. So we asked him to come up, and instead of having two separate guesting situations, why not just have them both up here at the same time? He said he wouldn't sit in the same room with you. Well, he sat in the same room because we talked for a long time just so a few I understand. minutes ago. He... I guess he won't sit in the same room if you're on TV. Uh, well, I guess maybe that's a different thing. A lot of people are waiting to uh, stand in the dock and to uh, ask you questions. Do you mind if they do it? Uh, well, uh, of course not, but they can probably uh, get a better answer if they read my book. A lot of them are I going to... I yes, three lives and half, in three years in Mississippi. I didn't work there. two and a half years writing that book just... Uh, for people to come ask me questions. Well, you know, we have an investment in you. <laughs> Each one of the people sitting out there and uh, who knows how many people watching at home all chipped in to send you to college. And you only stayed one year. No, let me tell you something. Um, That's the most expensive scholarship this country's ever given. Well, I would be happy if they'd given it to me. But uh, It would have been cheaper didn't. to buy you a little university of your own, I think. But let's see what the people in the dock have to say here. Would you state your name? UCLA. I can't hear you. He, he can't hear you. Speak a little louder. My name is Michelle Cooper Smith, and I'm a student at UCLA. I have four points I'd like to ask you. Speak up now. Okay. First of all, to me, you have only made one definite statement, and that's when you said you only want equal justice. You seem to preface all your statements with, I think. And that... I think you should make a more definite statement. You've never been on the Joe Pine show. I watched it, and I know that's what happens, but it seems that you could get more sympathy or more help if you said, this is the way I feel, instead of I think. Okay, secondly, in your, um, this judge system you're setting up, I'd like to ask a question. Who picks the judges and how are they picked? Aren't you going to run into a problem the same as you do with a jury as to who and how they're picked? Well, I think we do a pretty good job on our Supreme Court. Oh. That's the kind of system you want to set up? I forgot you people out here uh, don't like Warren, but uh, well, some of us like him. We think he's a good man. Okay. Now then, aren't I correct? Didn't you transfer to another school after a year at uh, Mississippi? I seem to remember reading about it. Um, 
That's no, a touchy point with you. Why do you hesitate? That's a very touchy thing with you. <laughs> Is that your Achilles heel? <laughs> Have we discovered the James Ward Meredith uh, skeleton in the castle? Well, I don't know. I, um, uh, it just shows that uh, you all didn't keep up with me as closely as uh, you think. Well, you were hiding for a while. Yeah. You know that. Well, I don't know. The Los Angeles Times found me. Here uh, we go again. We'll be back and have you comment on that after these <laughs> words. Stand by. We'll be right back. State your name, sir. My name is Lou Gothard, and uh, I had a question I'd like to pose, which maybe either Mr. Pine or Mr. Meredith could answer. We've had a lot of uh, uh, questions in national press and a lot of uh, problems uh, posed about the concept or the idea of black power. And I think that uh, one of the things that your march or whoever's march it turned out to be uh, brought up was the question of what the heck is black power? Uh, I'd like to pose the question, uh, what is white power? I think if there is such a thing as white power, uh, it must be a fairly decent power if indeed the Civil Rights Act of, uh, well, before that, let's go back to 1954 when there was no marching appreciably, there was no uh, street kind of demonstration going on. It was all due process and the Supreme Court finally handed down a decision which was subsequently tested and so forth. All if we are to agree that it was the white man's law under the white man's law. And the end result was that they said separate but equal facilities by the very nature of their separation negated their equality. And from now on, the Supreme Court says, uh, we will implement and we are urging all states to use all haste, although some have dragged their feet and kicked and screamed, tried not. The point was the federal government spoke. And that's why, one of the reasons why this man went to college. Uh, you say your name is Lou Gothard. That's right. And as you stand there and, and talk with me, you seem to be a very rational, uh, normal, peaceable, if I may use that word, human being. But aren't you the same Lou Gothard who attempted to agitate some students at Pasadena uh, School, uh, John Muir High School in Pasadena? What do you mean by agitate, Mr. Pine? Attempt to incite them to riot. Are you accusing me? No, I'm of asking you. I, are are asking you accusing you. me no, of I'm asking inciting you. to riot? I'm asking you. Can you answer that, yes or no? Yes, I can answer it, no. What does this have to do with the issue, though? I don't know. I'm just trying to connect. I don't understand. You look so calm and Well, collected. I feel pretty calm. How do you feel? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for me to, to picture you as a guy who would do these things. Getting back to this business of black power, mm -hmm. are you interested in having some? No, I'm not. I'm interested in having a community which does have some, which can be expressed in some ways that make, it, that make some differences in the community. Now, where do you see a man like our guest as far as the black power structure could be concerned? I think that Mr. Meredith has uh, uh, have made some very valuable kinds of contributions in this uh, question because he raises the question of the Bible or the gun. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a question of the Bible or the gun. It's a question of uh, what's in between the Bible and the gun and if it is effectiveness for the black community, then uh, I think there are some real uh, gains to be made in the black community. All right, thank you. Let's have thank the next you. man come up, please. State uh, your name. Uh, my name is Mwokedi Okoye. And where, where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. Speak a little louder, would you please? Uh, yeah, I have some questions for you, Mr. Pine. Yes. Um, you quite believe that America is a prosperous nation? I don't quite understand what you're saying. Uh, so you quite believe that America is a prosperous nation? Prosperous nation. A prosperous nation? Prosperous nation. Yes, I think it's a prosperous nation. Yeah. And uh, you, you believe uh, it's known all over the world? I'm sure of it. Yeah. Don't you think they that... They know uh, us by our loans. Yeah. Don't you think that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't you think that it's because of uh, the, uh, the, the position of America to the outside world that that's why uh, the federal government has hastened up to uh, take action to prevent uh, the molestation of the Negroes in America. I think that the world expects more of us than they do of any other part of the world. Yeah, don't you think that is the reason? Yes. Don't you think um, it's being inhuman? Because that action ought to have started the very moment this nation started. In the sense that America is a multiracial society, 
So any action that would be taken would be taken the very right moment that the nation started. I don't quite understand what you're saying. Do you understand what he means? Yes, I think I do. Go ahead. Uh, I think he's saying that uh, uh, <coughs> instead of trying to uh, correct these problems now, they should have been started in the beginning. Is that, yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. You you come from Africa. Yeah. All right. I want to throw it right back on you. Why didn't justice prevail back in Africa? In other words, why did your relatives capture James Meredith's relatives and sell them to white slave traders? Yeah, um, very good. That's very good. I, Thank I, you. I'm glad I you have know. something. <laughs> I mean, now, yeah. depending on how far back you want to go in history, we can get ridiculous about this. Yeah, right? okay. Now, uh, you quite believe there, there, there was slavery throughout the world? Yes, still is, I understand, in uh, Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, okay. Now, uh, this I have to tell you especially about uh, my forefathers who, who, who sold their children into slavery. Now, it's very cheap to come to somebody and say, uh, please give me this boy to serve me. I make him all right. I give him good food, do everything for him. It was the, the colonial system of rule, the indirect rule, where the white man would come to Africa and rule through the chiefs. He would tell the chief, now uh, you, you are the lord. You have everything. But inwardly, he collects the money. The chief will get the money and give it to the white man. And he takes it. This is very, very clear. And it's just the same thing that happened in the, in the case of slavery. Well, what People, does that the, tell you about mankind? About mankind. Now, when you talk of mankind, you're not including the, the black man. You are thinking of white man no, when you no, think I'm of when you say of white mankind, black man. Homo sapien. We'll be back to you, sir, in just a moment. We have the sponsor interrupting us here. I'm sure he's sorry about it. <laughs> right. James Meredith, what are your comments on what uh, your colleague from Africa has said so far? Well, uh, you all have talked about quite a few things. Um, I uh, <clears throat> don't really think that. Um, uh, there's much to be said for his position that it should have started in the beginning. Because in the beginning, uh, we had a whole different uh, concept. Uh, the uh, Negroes at that time were slaves. And, uh, of course, uh, you really uh, hit on a question that is a hard one to answer uh, about Africa. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, question of uh, why the Africans sold their brothers into slavery and um, I um, <coughs> I don't know I, I don't think the gentleman's facts are too good because uh, he speaks of colonialism well actually uh, the slave trade was before colonialism and um, uh, it's uh, uh, but I, I understand that problem uh, I think somewhere down the line, the blacks of the world are going to have to face the reality that we have no recorded glory. If we're to have a glory, we're going to have to build it. And uh, we can't find one that exists. I've looked, uh, that was one of the purposes of my trip to Africa. And um, uh, there's no glory in either case. If it's true that the white man went to Africa and tricked the African, then it embarrasses me that my forefathers were so weak that they could be tricked. So uh, it, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, when we try to find the easy answer, uh, I think uh, that's not the way. I, I think we're going to have to find the Yeah, heart. well, uh, I, I, you have to understand that if you uh, ask your brother to come and live with me, that's very all right. I'll say you, I'll, I'll be happy to have him in. Now, but you don't come in and control me. You don't, have, you don't come in and control my temper. Well, so I may get history, annoyed with him and molest him. Speaking of history, the way it happened in many cases were that one tribe would capture a good portion of the other one. And it was these people that sell into slavery. That's right. The people that sold into slavery. The ones they captured. In other words, they weren't selling the, the nice people that yeah, were who, in the who same we, tribe. Who, who were the inciters? What's that? Who were the inciters? Those who incited them to sell, sell well, the people. Well, oh, come I'll, on now. Let me ask this question. What, what, Do what you I'm find any glory in a person that's so weak that he can be incited? No, I don't. I don't find any glory. Yes, um, you seem to be attributing weakness uh, to the person who, who's been deceived. Yes, that's well, right. Well, you have to understand that uh, this is a natural flaw in everybody. You know, you better be careful. <laughs> He'll think you're a plant. Uh, um, 
look, I, I don't think I have to explain nothing to nobody. I'm, I'm concerned <laughs> about, uh, I, uh, I've been to Africa. I love Africans. When I went on Mississippi March, I had an African, Eben and Ivory Kane, that most Americans didn't understand, but most Africans understood. Newspapers reported uh, it. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, again, I have to ask Mr. Pine again. Uh, yeah, very quickly, because I want to change colors for a little bit. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> Uh, when you, when you, when you, there was a, there was a question you asked Mr. Meredith, uh, whether something, uh, I think, uh, uh, what he received in the South, what happened to him in the South, then you asked him whether it was in the North. But you have to remember that when you talk about the South of America and the North, you are talking of America. And besides, uh, a foreigner... I don't agree with that either. When some bum won't bury a, a dead Vietnam hero in, in Alabama or Georgia, whatever it is, because of his color, that makes me just as angry as it makes you or Mr. Meredith or anybody else. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm See? saying. So it's your so problem. They, they don't speak for the country. Yeah. But now, look, do me a favor. Let me change colors here a little bit now. Come on up here, young man. Okay. You've been standing there patiently. Let's uh, hear your name, please. Uh, yes, the name is uh, Raymond Schrank, and uh, this is for uh, Mr. Meredith. Fine. Now, the last couple of weeks, you've had, uh, uh, Mr. Pines had uh, several uh, color leaders on his program. And I've been listening to these uh, men, and I've been listening to you tonight. And, um, well, the question is, I want to know why it seems that, uh, especially, say, as it concerns uh, the situation in Watts and other uh, big cities, that uh, whenever there is uh, racial trouble, such as uh, the riots you've had here in Ra Watts, that uh, the uh, colored leaders are continually taking uh, the um, defensive on this and finding excuses for it, rather than uh, to stand up and denounce the uh, small minority that is causing the trouble. Now, are, are you making these leaders, or did the Negroes make them leaders? Uh, I don't know. I've heard many people say that these were self-appointed leaders. They're described as such in the, uh, in the newspapers. Sometimes they're leading Negroes, sometimes they're Negro leaders. And I think that this distinction, uh, we're going to have to start making that distinction more clear. What are uh, you? Uh, are you a Negro I'm leader? I'm neither one. I'm neither one. Well, you were at the head of the march. Who was the leader if you weren't? <laughs> you keep thinking I'm not going to ask you these questions. Don't you? <laughs> you keep hoping. Well, you can't deny that you were in a position of leadership at that time. You can't deny that. Even though uh, Martin Luther King came along and stole your thunder a little bit. <laughs> of course, well, he, he named no, it the Meredith not, March. That's not true. That's not true. I think he got more um, press than you did toward the end. You know, Martin Luther King is a Negro, and everything that I experience, he experiences too. Uh, I don't believe that. I bet he doesn't experience one thing about your trip to Disneyland, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Either you're an individual or you're not. If he breaks his leg, you won't feel it. <laughs> Have another drink. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back to James Meredith right now. We're going to pause for these commercial words. <laughs> State your name, sir. Newton Champion. You don't have to lean that close. Just stay right there. You're fine. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to comment on a white power structure. Okay. Well, to me, uh, the white power structure is uh, the white man have everything in the country, controls everything, and the Negroes uh, really don't have too much to say. This is, to me, what white structure is. Um, you take, for instance, uh, I'm an actor. But uh, white people controls that too, and it's very hard for Negroes to be able to get anything, not unless uh, we have to go by the white people rules and regulations. Very hard for anybody to get a part in a picture. That's what you're talking about. Well, this is true, but I'm talking about everything else in the United States controlled by the white people. This is the white people's structures, power structure. This is what I mean. Well, here you are on television. How do you account for that? Well, I'm here. <laughs> well, how do you account for that? By the white people. Yeah, they're not keeping you off. No. They're not even putting you down for talking against them. Think it over. But it's, but there's... Uh, I mean, it's not all bad, is it? No, it's not all bad, but, okay. I, but still the white people are in power, and we really don't have an equal say as white people do, uh, according to the racial... I wonder how many people sitting in our audience really think they are powerful or have power over you. <laughs> no. Does anybody here think that they are enjoying white power? I mean, be honest if you think you are. I can't see uh, one hand going I would up. be very surprised if there's any white here that doesn't feel that way. Oh. See, there's the proof right there. 
100 percent proof. Well, they're just disagreeing with you. They're not marching on you. Here we go. What is your name, ma'am? My name's Myra Lee, Mr. Pine. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if I can speak in half of Mr. Meredith. Uh, I'm a little disturbed. The last question that you just asked the audience about white supremacy, uh, I'm quite sure that the audience uh, does not feel that there is white power, but I bet you if you took a poll, you'd find a lot of discrimination. Now, I sat out in the audience. You would under any sampling group. In other words, yes. you, could, take a, you mm -hmm. could have this place packed with Negroes and there would be discrimination. Everybody discriminates. When you bought that coat as opposed to a darker one or a lighter one, you discriminated in some way. Uh, you're, you're, uh, when you picked your sunglasses, you chose that frame over another one. That's Freudian self-love, isn't it? No, it is not. It's, it's not. It not is then not, why didn't you pick a big, ugly not, pair? It's, <laughs> this is, you know, Mr. Pine. When this man sitting next to me picked out that suit, uh, you've made your point. Now, may I speak, sir? I didn't think I made my point clear to yes, you. Yes, you made if, your if point. you're satisfied, it's not I made Freudian. it fine. Go ahead. I know a little bit about Freudian, too. Uh, I, I don't want to seem too degree. powerful here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Pine, I want to state first that I didn't come on this program to argue with you because too often I've heard you to tell somebody to take a walk, and I don't wish to have you tell me to take a walk. But I would... <clears throat> I don't think, I don't think I would, you are the disorderly type of person who has to be told that. No, place. I'm not an actor, and I'm not here to make a ham of myself. I really want to speak for Mr. Meredith, because think I think he needs you to he, speak for him? No, now he might not need me to speak for him, but I think he does need a little defense. Now, Mr. Pine, I know that you're catalytic, and this is your type of program. Oh, please I, I, don't psychoanalyze me. Please don't I, do that. Well, I'm not psychoanalyzing you any more than, you know, I'm interested I'm just in having people state their minds. And stop explaining yourself, stop explaining me, and make your statement. There, I won't even interrupt you. Go ahead. I don't believe this. Provided you don't psychoanalyze me. Go ahead. You have needled this man from the time he sat down. You have done nothing... It doesn't... I don't care about the audience. No, I'm not going to take a walk until Mr. Pine tells me to take a walk. You're not running the show. This... No, I, I'm surprised... You feel that way, Mr. Meredith? You... That you have been picked on and abused? May I finish the statement before he gives me the answer, please? This might have something well, to do with... Well, he's not a ventriloquist dummy. He can answer for himself. But may I finish my statement, please? I don't want to be hostile with you, Mr. Pine, really. <laughs> But you have to be to retaliate in order to get anywhere with you because you're going to tear the person in the beef box apart. Actually, you're going to tear them down. You're going to do your best to humiliate me, but I'm going I'm to stand to here and I'm going to try to if be... there's a man standing next to you, were you humiliated in I any way? I asked him to stand here. I need his Well, were you... Did I pick on you? Did I humiliate you in any way? I'd like to get no, back to... Huh? No, you didn't. No, I didn't. I'd like to get back to the educational... You can't do anything without analyzing me. I'd like now, to... Now, I think I have given you sufficient time to make a point Not on it is. I'd like to get back to the educational... Uh, the educational right now, right aspect. Right now, I'm going to ask you to hold on a moment. All right, sir. If Mr. Meredith wants you to continue, then we'll continue. <laughs> Well, I, um... <coughs> yes? Take a drink. I won't be... <laughs> Mr. Barry... Well, whatever his answer, it wasn't overwhelming in any direction. I will not be offended if he says don't continue, <clears throat> but I think that I understand him. I think that you have hurt your cause today, and you have equally hurt his cause, Joe. This man showed... This man showed a lot... Well, I don't care what the you audience thinks. This man showed a days. lot of courage to go to a school where he wasn't wanted. Now, as far as the educational uh, backing of the United States government, we should not have had to have done this. We <laughs> should have had this boy go to a school anywhere he wanted to go to. All right. So well, you may I ask you certainly. not to take a walk, but to move to one side and let the gentleman standing certainly. behind you come Thank up, you. please. <laughs> yes. Great. Stand behind the mic and raise it up a little bit to suit your height, sir. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> Joe, I, I'd like to tell you how I uh, 
sort of uh, volunteered to fight in the war in poverty, and uh, somehow or another I seemed to get pretty co poor because of it. Uh, if you remember when uh, the uh, Johnson administration sent the uh, Braceros uh, packing their bags to go back to Mexico, it was one of the uh, primary steps in the war on poverty because it's obvious you cannot fight poverty in this country if you have to import it up here from the Republic of Mexico, like the Rosseros uh, were being brought up. And Why has this got to do with Mr. Meredith? He's never been accused of being a Bracero. <laughs> <laughs> what has that got to do with the topic of well, discussion? Well, I'm getting into that, uh, you know, very shortly. I'm going to try well, to would be you very even <laughs> get it in there shorter? Well, <laughs> would you believe two seconds? Two seconds, all right. Here were 100,000 jobs available uh, throughout the, uh, the entire Southwest. And the first thing I did, I contacted organizations on my own hook, acting on my own as a volunteer and trying to carry out what I considered uh, Secretary uh, Wirtz, Willard Wirtz's uh, uh, program. I talked to uh, civil rights groups in my own town of Pasadena, and oddly enough, I got very little assistance from them whatsoever. So it ended up that I went packing my bag to uh, go up to a neighboring town. This is, I thought, that doesn't concern own. Mr. Meredith at all. All right, sir, it's been grand hearing from you. We must take up your second phase of your career some other time. Mr. Meredith, we've run out of time. I'm sorry that that extraneous matter got in there. But it's been good having you here, and you seem to be in uh, fine fettle in spite of being shot. How many pellets did you take? Oh, about 100, I guess. 100. We'll be back with another guest following these words from the sponsor. Stand by.